Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to this uh, special um, full authority meeting of the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority this Friday, November the 4th. Um, before we begin, I'm going to start with our land acknowledgement. The Niagara Peninsula watershed is situated within the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Attawandaronk, and Anunnabeg, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, many of whom continue to live and work here today. The territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the land protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today, the watershed is home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. Through the 2021 to 2023 strategic plan, we reconfirm our commitment to shared stewardship of natural resources and deep appreciation of, of Indigenous culture and history within our watershed. Uh, Mr. Bival, could you please do a roll call? I most certainly will. Do we have Member Beatty? I see him. Let me try that again. Here. <laughs> Member Brady. Member Clark. Good morning. Member Cridlin. Present. Member Fior. Good morning. Member Holinga. Present. Member Hewson. I see her. Member Ingrail. Present. Member Johnson. Good morning. Member Kimmel. Present. Member McKenzie. Good morning. Vice Chair Metcalf. Present. Member Rapley. Present. I have regrets for Member Sherton, and I understand Member Smith will be arriving in about half an hour. Member Steele? Here. Member Woodhouse? Present. Member Wright? Present. And of course, Chair Foster. Yes, I am here. Are there any declarations of conflict of interest this morning? Hearing none. Um, let us move into our items. Oh, uh, first of all, with the agenda, um, uh, to Chandra and to Grant, um, are there any changes to the agenda that uh, that you wish to make this morning? Good morning. Thank you, Chair Foster. Grant, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say, I think there's the addition of a report that was circulated last night, report number FA45. Right, and where is that going to arrive in, in discussion items? That's correct. Okay, so it will be point B within the within that agenda. Okay. Um, so I need someone. Oh, uh, Member Johnson. Oh yes. Uh, uh, yep. Yeah, uh, we'll we'll come to you with the with the new fellow shortly. So, <laughs> um, so we need approval of our agenda uh, with this addition. So Member Wright, would you uh, move that we approve this? And Member Steele, would you second it, please? Great. Thank you. Um, is there anyone opposed to us uh, with the agenda has been announced? Hearing none, I'm going to turn it to Member Johnson for a moment. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, so first of all, I just wanted to announce this is going to be my last meeting with the MPCA as I am retiring. Uh, and I want to congratulate all my colleagues who had a very successful election and uh, I look forward to watching you for the next four years. Uh, so I'd just like to take a few minutes to um, introduce my replacement, uh, Councillor-elect Mark Tattison. And uh, Mark was actually a, uh, is a retired principal, and for the last few weeks he's been shadowing me in my job. And you can see that he's sitting in my Glanbrook office, so that can tell you that he's fully taken over, which is wonderful. And I know that he's very eager to get started. And I know that uh, everyone here that's present and, and those who are not present are going to help uh, Councillor Tattison get his feet wet into it in the NPCA. He's a very avid um, environmental uh, aware person, if there's such a word. 
But anyways, I just wanted to welcome Mark and introduce him to everyone before we get started. And for quorum purposes, Mr. Chair, I have an appointment at, at noon, so I may be signing off around that time. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, good morning, Mark. Um, any, any comments you want to give us this morning? At this time, I'm just going to observe and uh, thank you for welcoming me. And I look forward to uh, being part of the NPCA. Okay, great. Thank you. We're we're looking forward to having you as part of it. Um, big shoes to fill for you, by the way. So, um, and by the way, um, if if we end up getting to noon out of this, Brenda, just come and shoot me. I, I my uh, our intention is to have the meeting done as uh, significantly before that. So. Um, Let's move into our first item this morning, and that is the correspondence uh, dated October 25th from Jennifer Keyes, Director, Resources Planning and Development Policy Branch, Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, uh, concerning the More Homes Built Faster Ontario Housing Supply Action Plan 2022-2023. Um, this particular item is for receipt. So can I have uh, a member Cridlin please move that we... Uh, we accept this for receipt and member Hewson, would you please second that? Yes, um, can you hear me? Uh, yep. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you now, good. Um, yes, yeah, so any questions or any comments on this particular uh, report is, uh, by the way, the, or this um, particular correspondence, um, and obviously this will be coming into play later with our, our additional information. Seeing none, anyone opposed to us uh, receiving this uh, correspondence? Seeing none, thank you. Um, so with this particular meeting, the, the intention was for us to be going through and uh, doing um, a review and, uh, and, uh, um, and uh, approval of our policies that have been updated. And this, of course, came into play out of um, out of uh, the previous changes to the CA Act, and and uh, Chandra and her staff have been extremely busy on uh, on uh, preparing information for us, and um, hence the over 600 page uh, document that we had uh, to review before this meeting. So, um, to begin with, we're going to do a presentation on this. Um, and so uh, we're going to have the PowerPoint presentation with, from Karen uh, Wienecki, uh, Director of Practice Planning and Solutions, Inc., uh, David DeLuce, our Senior Manager of Environmental Planning, and of course, Leilani Lee Yates, who is our NPCA Director, and of course, uh, Chandra is here this morning as well. So um, uh, Karen, I guess I'm going to turn this over to you. Through you, Chair, I'll kick it off. And okay, then great. I, we will circulate uh, the slides through Karen and David. So Perfect. Just Thank you. A moment here, and I'll get set up. Great. Thank you, Leilani. Okay. And can everyone see the presentation, the slide deck? Okay. It's there. It's good. Yep. Okay. Great. Uh, so, good morning, board members. Uh, over the last several months, our staff and consultant team have put a tremendous amount of work into producing the new MPCA planning and permitting policy document and procedural manual that is before you today. At the beginning of the year, we set out an ambitious and aggressive work plan to ensure that the board would have the opportunity to participate in this process to develop these documents and be in a position to make a decision on the final outcome. The new policy document and procedural manual achieves our main goals to develop clear guidance for the implementation of our plan review and section 28 permit mandates that will help improve our delivery of services and improve the understanding of our roles and responsibilities within our watershed communities. With the introduction of Bill 23, More Homes Built Faster Act on October 25th, the proposals to amend the Conservation Authorities Act and regulations Planning Act and Provincial Policy Statement and the proposed changes to the Ontario Wetland Evaluation System would have a dramatic effect on the MPCA's plan review and permitting mandate. As such, it's staff's recommendation that the Board approve the new policy document and procedural manual at this time to better position us to, to address the inevitable changes. 
The new documents provide a much needed clarity and direction staff and applicants need now under the current legislation while establishing a solid foundation for any future updates that will be required. Staff followed the guidance for updating uh, the policies outlined by the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and within our current policy document. And we worked closely with the governance committee to receive, to receive input and advice at key milestones throughout the process. Through our presentation today, we'll provide an overview of our, comp of our accomplishments and walk the board through the new documents while highlighting the key changes. With me today is our project team, Karen Wayanecki, Director of Practice for Planning Solutions, Inc., Sal Spitali, Principal and Co-Owner of North-South Environmental, Inc., and David Deleuze, Senior Manager of Environmental Planning and Policy. I'd also like to acknowledge the many MPCA staff and our Planning and Development and Watershed Strategies and Climate Change teams who've made significant contributions to these documents. So for our presentation today, um, I'll provide a recap of where we started and highlight what we've accomplished. Karen will provide a summary of the phase two discussion papers, engagement and consultation results. And David will walk us through the new MPCA policy document and overview of the structure as well as the key changes. And then walk us through the MPCA procedural manual structure um, and the technical guidance documents that we've included. So just to recap, uh, our current policy document and our policies represent a compendium of our official opinion on purposes of applying subsection three of our Inter Ontario regulation 15506. So that's uh, our, our permitting. We rely on the policies contained in the document as does the board members and applicants uh, seeking a permit from the MPCA as well as those looking for a recommendation on Planning Act applications. We identified back in 2021 that the current policy document needed updating based on changes in corporate direction through the new strategic plan, ongoing partner municipal official plan reviews, and the provincial leg legislation and pending changes to the CA Act and other regulations at that time. We also identified the need to document the technical guidance and best practices for implementing our policies. Uh, at the beginning of the year, we initiated a two-phased approach to our work plan. The phase one included the identification of gaps, deficiencies, inconsistencies in the current MPCA policy document. It included a jurisdictional review of other high growth Greater Golden Horseshoe conservation authorities, looking at their best practices and policy approaches. We identified uh, the need for technical studies or mapping update gaps that would be required to support the policy document. The phase one report was presented to the board with direction to proceed to the phase two uh, development of the policy document and procedural manual. A key conclusion from the phase one work is that our current policies do meet the intent of the PPS and address the five tests of our permit application under section 28 of the Conservation Authorities Act and our regulation. And some policies, however, do, do appear to be more flexible than other conservation authority policy documents. So we are starting from a good basis and moving forward. Phase two built upon the analysis of phase one. The themes identified in our discussion papers were not selected at random. They emerged from the phase one work and we uh, conducted an engagement strategy to elicit the input um, through the production of the discussion papers and uh, stakeholder meetings and consultation. In June, before we started, uh, you did tell us, uh, manage your expectations and that it's critical um, and it's important how the engagement process is undertaken and that input being sought is related to the gap analysis results rather than eliciting various opinions. You also said the policy should be supported by science-based decision-making, that it's critical to engage with our municipal partners and there should be a collaborative approach and also that it's important to engage with our environmental policies because they are key stakeholders. We kicked off the phase two work in June and met regularly with the governance committee to seek their input and advice. And in the last five months, we've delivered an interim section 28 environmental impact study guideline, the interim wetland procedure document, 
We developed a project web portal on MPCA's Get Involved engagement platform that we've kept up to date to inform members of the public and stakeholders on our process. We developed a digital online survey, two discussion papers, one on the general themes and one on buffers. We had seven focused stakeholder workshops and meetings. We met uh, and had a workshop with the public advisory committee. We had a public information session. We offered and held a session specific for ENGO members who were invited. Um, and we completed uh, the phase two discussion papers engagement summary report that this board received at their last meeting. So this work resulted in the policy document and procedural manual that's before you today. We recognize that science and best practices will continue to evolve and improve, and as such, it's staff's intention to update the procedural manual as needed to ensure our decisions are guided by current science and practices. So at this time, I'd like to invite Karen to provide an overview of the feedback and comments we received on the discussion papers. Uh, so over to you, Karen. Thanks very much, Leilani, and good morning, everybody. Thank you so very much for the opportunity to share uh, some time with you this morning and obviously to present the results of the engagement uh, sessions that we convened. Next slide, please. There were a number of uh, directions that we received, both during the phase one analysis, but also during the commencement of phase two. Uh, recognizing the importance of um, building on and recognizing that that engagement was critical in terms of developing the document. So how did we engage stakeholders in the community? First and foremost, we developed a very robust and fulsome consultation and engagement strategy. As Leilani mentioned, uh, there was a dedicated web portal that was identified um, that contained a central repository for all information related to this particular initiative. We began by developing a frequently asked questions document that will offer some fundamental answers to some key and critical basic questions that folks may have. We developed a digital survey to ensure that there was an, an adequate opportunity for, for folks to provide their input and feedback on a 24-7 basis as convenient for them. We developed a dedicated email address for those who may not have found the digital survey to be um, uh, the, the format that they were looking for and would rather provide more fulsome commentary in the form of emails. Uh, direct invitations to participate went out to NPCA stakeholder contacts and environmental NGOs, as Leilani noted. And I recall Member K. Wall indicating that um, convening meetings with the environmental community was critical given the important role that they play as partners. One on one workshops were held with stakeholders, including the Niagara Home Builders and conversations with Indigenous partners and a public information session was held. We also looked to um, the Public Advisory Committee for additional advice and guidance regarding ongoing consultation and engagement for phase two. Next slide, please, Leilani. So who did we engage with? Well, beginning the middle of August, we convened a workshop with the Niagara area planners and you'll see, I'm not going to read uh, the number of participants who were there, but uh, you, you can see on the screen the, uh, the participation levels. On the 16th, we convened a workshop with the city of Hamilton planning staff and on the 24th held a public information session. On the 25th of August, we convened a workshop with Haldeman County planning staff. And on the 25th, the same day, we also convened a workshop with the public advisory committee members. On the 19th, we held a very detailed workshop with NPCA staff, <clears throat> excuse me. And on the 19th, we also set up uh, a workshop specifically and invited environmental NGOs to participate. I will note that we, while we kept the session open and that was an evening session, we did not have any uh, participants uh, attend. On the 27th, we convened a meeting with the Niagara Home Builders and the region of Niagara. 
And on the 18th of October, Six Nations of the Grand. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so what were some of the observations that we made in general? <clears throat> you likely have seen the comprehensive engagement synopsis report. But for those who did take the time to attend workshops, the public information session, and the specific focused workshops, we received very valuable input. We also heard from those who attended that this work was viewed by them as being particularly important. And so there was a broad base of support for updating the policy document and also for developing an accompanying procedural manual. So while the overall interest in engaging was not as robust as we had anticipated, the general interest was much higher as demonstrated through the visits to the Get Involved Project web portal. So we had 534 total visits to the web portal, which averaged just under 50 per day. 14 of the visitors engaged through the online survey posted on the guest book and asked questions. 135 visitors were informed of the project by downloading a document, viewing a video, visiting the key dates page, visiting the frequently asked questions document, as well as multiple pages throughout that web portal. The top three documents that were downloaded from the web portal included the buffer width discussion paper, 63 downloads, the policy theme discussion paper, similarly 62 downloads, and the phase one update report to the board, 35 downloads. Next slide, please, Leilani. So critically from your perspective, what did we hear? <clears throat> we heard a number of general comments, but you will likely be particularly interested in the areas broadly, in the areas where comments converged and also where they diverged. Next slide, please. In terms of general comments, we heard that municipal planners for the most part, not surprisingly, were at the time of consultation and engagement, particularly focused and concerned about the implications of Bill 109 and the need to continue to focus on process improvements. There was also general commentary that continued engagement with stakeholders as the policy development is developed was desired by uh, most sector groups, representatives from the agricultural community and the home building industry. Representatives from the home builders were particularly concerned that the plan review process should not become more complex um, or more protracted. And in this regard, they had expressed some concern with the inclusion of policies around cumulative impacts. But I think that um, for the most part, um, an explanation of the role of NPCA and the fact that NPCA looks at development applications from the lens of cumulative impacts across the watershed uh, would allay those concerns. Agricultural representatives were very supportive of the policies in the current document, noting that for the most part, the existing policies do support agricultural practice. Next slide, please. In terms of those areas of convergence, those who participated were, as I mentioned already, very supportive of the work that NPCA is doing to develop a fulsome, robust, relevant, reflective and up-to-date policy document. There is certainly agreement among those that we engaged with to include references throughout the document to provide clarity regarding who is responsible for what, as well as key linkages to partner agencies and their respective mandates. There was broad confusion expressed um, among those that we consulted with around who is responsible for what with respect to natural heritage. And therein lies an opportunity to also clarify the roles and responsibilities associated with natural heritage. And when David DeLuce walks you through the updates to the document, you will see that many of those 
changes, if not all of them, have been adequately addressed. There was also an agreement that a buffer with decision support tool should in fact be not only developed but utilized by NPCA. In terms of the areas of divergence, next slide please, Leilani, and thank you. Not surprisingly, we expected that we would hear very divergent opinions in several key areas, first being ecological net gain. So when we embarked even on the phase one work, I think it's fair to say that one of the most controversial issues we anticipated, and certainly this, um, this, this was evident in phase two, was the development of new policies concerning non-PSW reconfiguration and recreation. So in engaging with municipal partners, environmental representatives who did attend the public information session and members of the development community, there's very little consensus about the approach that should be taken by NPCA. Positions, not surprisingly, do vary. Environmental representatives simply want NPCA to just say no. Others feel that there, there needs to be some degree of flexibility, that if properties have a less significant ecological value and are being rendered undevelopable for the most part, the impact of including or not including those policies must be fully understood. Some municipal planners are of the view that NPCA policy should align with regional policy. Other municipal planners are of the view that policies between the region and NPCA differ now, and that different policies moving forward are not going to be problematic. Others feel that there is a need for an understanding of policy implications and potential unintended consequences. Next slide, please. The other area where opinion and perspective differs is on climate change and buffers. Views on climate change are widely divergent, particularly among those who responded to the survey, <clears throat> watershed, excuse me, municipal partners, city of Hamilton, for example, have indicated that from their lens, this is without question the single most important issue for them and that policies developed by NPCA need to recognize the work that is underway at the municipal level. The issue of buffers is another contentious area for which there is a lack of consensus regarding the most appropriate policy approach to be adopted by NPCA. Some are of the view that a robust policy offers clear direction, while others feel that there's a need for flexibility that is reflective of local circumstance. Next slide, please, Leilani. With that, I, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to David Deleuze, who's going to walk you through the new policy document, and in particular, highlight a number of the key and critical changes that have been made to address the commentary, input, and feedback that we received. Thank you, David. The floor is yours. Thank you, Karen. Next slide, please. So just a brief overview of the structure of the new document. Uh, it's basically split up into three parts. So the first part is just general context about our watershed. The second part is environmental planning policies, and those are really the policies that we would apply when doing plan review functions. So under the Planning Act or other legislation. Part C is uh, primarily for our permitting role, and it does overlap with the plan uh, review role. I'll speak to that in, in a little bit. There's also a definition section uh, for certain terms in the document. They're uh, defined. And then the appendices, uh, extra documents or other um, reference material that's been added. Just uh, a note on the use of pictures and diagrams. Uh, just like the previous version, we do continue to use diagrams and pictures to help illustrate or explain 
concepts or um, especially when it comes to uh, different components of a, a hazard we use uh, diagrams to help explain that a new feature we're using in this particular version of the document are text box and those are basically just uh, extra context around certain concepts they're not policies in and of themselves but they're intended to provide additional context around um, certain topics and that's a similar approach to what uh, the region of Niagara used in their new official plan and what other uh, conservation authorities use. Next slide, please. So part A, next slide. So chapter one uh, just highlights who the MPCA is and what we do. It draws attention to our uh, recent uh, strategic plan and the vision of nature for all. And this is really meant to be an education piece for the reader on what the MPCA's roles and responsibilities are. Now, it also highlights the legislative framework that the Conservation Authority works in. And in, as you note there, the current framework as uh, Bill 23 is uh, proposing some changes to how we would operate in the future. But presently, uh, we typically use the Conservation Authorities Act. We're involved on the Planning Act. We uh, use the provincial policy statement. We're involved with the provincial plan, so the Greenbelt plan, uh, Place to Grow, and the Niagara Escarpment plan, and then also the regional uh, official plans and local municipal official plans. Next slide. So part B, environmental planning. Next slide, please. So again, as I mentioned, this chapter is really what guides our uh, plan review function and the pr previous document did have policies regarding plan review, but it didn't really articulate those well. So we now have general policies that guide us when carrying out our legislative roles and responsibilities on commenting on natural hazards for planning act applications. Uh, it also provides uh, specifically on aggregate resources, uh, the aggregate resources act, a new section that was not in the old document. So that helps guide our commenting when, for example, uh, being a partner on a JART or a joint aggregate review team and commenting on an aggregate application. Uh, also, our roles with Environmental Assessment Act and the Niagara Garment Planning and Development Act, so NEC permits. Our commenting roles and responsibilities with our MOUs with municipal partners, and then providing input and supporting watershed and subwatershed planning efforts that municipalities are required to do under uh, provincial uh, direction. Also in the plan review uh, section, we have new policies that help promote sustainable design, uh, particularly around uh, site design like stormwater, um, making sure there's uh, sustainable design elements in there and consideration of cumulative impacts. And again, that was something that was not properly articulated in the previous document. So now there's different sections that make reference to addressing cumulative impacts. Next slide, please. So just going through a few of the specific sections, uh, the watershed and subwatershed planning roles. So the policy document now articulates our role in supporting municipalities in undertaking the various watershed plans as uh, they've been directed. It outlines our roles and responsibility as a watershed resource agency that implements an integrated watershed management approach in supporting planning and policy for protecting and enhancing watersheds. And again, it also stresses the need to consider cumulative impacts on the watershed natural system. Next slide. <laughs> There's a new section in there. Um, this was in the previous document scattered throughout. Uh, we've put it into one section so it's clearer and uh, easier to find. But this is essentially uh, from section 3.1 of the provincial policy statement. And again, it just articulates in our planning role, what our policies are for uh, natural hazards. And it's also to be read in conjunction with the policies in chapters three to 10, which is used for our permitting role. And one note in here is that, and again, this comes from the provincial policy statement, it adds uh, consideration for the impacts of a changing climate that may increase the risk associated with natural hazards. So this is now better articulated in the new document. Next slide, please. Section 2.4, which is lot creation. There's not particularly much new here. It's the same policies before, but again, they've been consolidated into 
one section rather than scattered throughout uh, a number of sections in the old document. One particular note though is we have changed the wetland um, setback for lot creation to 30 meters from wetland. So if you're doing lot creation, the new lot boundary has to be set back 30 meters from uh, the wetlands. And also it cross references the, uh, the buffer policies for wetlands. Next slide, please. Section 2.5 is a more enhanced section on environmental assessments. In the previous document, uh, there were references, again, scattered throughout uh, the different sections that made uh, reference to environmental assessments. And not each section was consistent in terms of how much uh, policy framework there was. Um, the wetland section had a lot. Other sections just simply said, yes, you can go ahead and permit infrastructure through an environmental assessment, but no guiding framework. So the new policy document adds that framework that was missing, and it takes into account consideration of cumulative impacts of infrastructure on the watershed, uh, provides guidance for compensation when dealing, when, uh, when dealing with regulated features, particularly where protection cannot be achieved. And want to stress that um, it's not just automatic that you go ahead and remove a feature and, and compensate it. You have to go through the protection hierarchy and once that has been appropriately uh, addressed, if it turns out that uh, avoidance is not possible, minimizing the impacts aren't possible, and that the only option is to uh, encroach into a feature, then there is now uh, guiding policies on how compensation would be applied in that context. Next slide, please. Just quickly, section 2.6 is our municipal drain policy. It's uh, essentially a carryover. Excuse me. It's a carryover from our previous document. There was one change made to um, make it uh, clear when we're dealing with municipal drains through wetlands so that we're not in conflict with the, uh, the Drainage Act and it gives staff the ability to work through um, uh, resolving issues where a new drain is proposed in a wetland. Uh, so the previous pro uh, policy did not allow for drains, new drains, I should say, into a wetland. The current policy allows for the consideration of that. Um, next slide, please. Again, we now have a new mineral aggregate resources section, which just simply provides guidance for staff when commenting on uh, Aggregate Resource Act application, so new quarries, new pits. And again, just to emphasize our role in that is primarily as a commenting agency. We do not have the regulatory authority to require a permit of uh, app, uh, aggregate applications, but we didn't have any policies that guided how we made our comments. So that gap has been uh, filled. Next slide, please. NEC development permits. Again, a new section that provides more guidance on how we review these applications. Uh, first and foremost, we stress that we cannot issue a permit under our legislation until the NEC development permit has been issued. And again, making sure that that is clear and understood by applicants when coming in for an AGRA or from uh, an MPCA permit. Uh, we consult with the Niagara Escarpment Commission staff for works proposed on NPCA owned land. So we've had a number of projects, capital works projects recently that involve lands within the escarpment. And again, there was no guidance in the previous document on how to deal with that. So that gap, uh, we've put policies in there to address that. And then where the NPCA has submitted a development application to the uh, NEC on our own lands, it stresses that MPCA staff will review the development permit objectively and in accordance with the policies of this document uh, of, and the procedural manual. Again, that wasn't clarified in the previous document, so it's now provides more transparency in how we review our own projects when going through external processes. Next slide, please. Section 2.9 pertains to climate change. So We've updated the guidance for that. Again, the MPC coming from the uh, strat plan is to be a leader in climate change research 
and analysis to support municipal and watershed partner policies and to help mit uh, mitigate and adapt to the impacts of a changing climate in our watershed. So it's linkages or linkage to goals of the 10 uh, year strategic plan that provides uh, support uh, for implementation of green infrastructure and best practices in that area and also stresses the need for research to determine cumulative watershed impacts from extreme weather and land use changes. Next slide. Uh, natural heritage, and again, as mentioned earlier uh, in the presentation, um, clarifying our role and responsibilities um, between the MPCA and municipalities when it comes to commenting on natural heritage under the Planning Act, so features outside of NPCA regulated areas. So the new document now provides that guidance and um, it gives uh, speaks more to our commenting roles on natural heritage under MLUs with the City of Hamilton and Haldeman County. Next slide, please. Stormwater management review under MOUs. So it provides more guidance, which was not present in the previous document for how we look at stormwater management when we're reviewing planning applications, uh, particularly again in Hamilton and in Haldeman, where we still have a commenting role on stormwater management. It also stresses, this is a new uh, policy, it stresses the use of low impact development or LID, green infrastructure and other sustainable technologies to achieve uh, the stormwater criteria required for a proposed development. Next slide, please. So a new section, uh, Minister Zoning Orders. This basically now sets out the policies for how we would look at and comment on municipal zoning orders uh, submitted through uh, to a municipality um, and circulated to the Conservation Authority. So it sets out the requirements for pre-consultation meetings and coordinating those with the municipalities, provides guidance for how we would impose conditions to our NPCA permits uh, when those eventually come in. And it also references the MZO hearing guidelines, which uh, is essentially our board hearing guidelines that were updated, uh, I believe it was last year, to account for the, um, the MZO uh, requirements. That's an appendix to the, the policy document. Next slide, please. Land securement, uh, notwithstanding that the land securement strategy is, I believe, going to the board for approval in December, we did provide some, uh, I'll say, more general policies in our document to land securement. So it's to provide guidance for when working with municipal partners to seek the securement of environmental lands through the development approval process. That was not well articulated in our old document. I think the only section that really articulated that was for wetlands. Uh, the new document now has a standalone section with policies for that. Uh, the MPC will consider taking ownership of uh, environmental lands through gratuitous dedication if the lands meet the criteria within our land securement strategy and policy. So again, tying the connection to the, um, the new land securement strategy once that's approved. Now, prior to the close or transfer of lands to the MPCA, it does stress that there are the MPCA may potentially require a number of legal and or administrative items to be completed as part of due diligence. So typical things as uh, surveys and uh, all the legal uh, requirements that need to be done to ensure that the transfer happens properly and to also make sure that uh, we're protecting um, MPCA interest uh, and minimizing any risk or, or liability to us. Next slide, please. So part C, which is the permitting section. Uh, next slide, please. So part C starts off with a general policy section and the previous document had a general policy section, but it wasn't overly helpful for guiding decision-making uh, with the rest of the document. So that section has essentially been revamped. It provides more education and awareness of what features and areas are regulated, the types of works, uh, that would require permits and the types of works that would not. Excuse me. It provides general guidance policies for the administration of the regulation. So it has a number of policies that apply to all features regardless of what's in there and provides overarching um, guidance. So some of the other sections in the old document, for example, large fill, we had a previous chapter devoted to that. 
that has now been moved to the general policy section and stress that it applies in any feature where over 250 cubic meters of fill is being placed. Uh, the document in chapter three also provides further clarification on the five tests, in particular, the conservation of lands tests. And it also stresses uh, for agricultural lands in regulated areas, um, what is allowed as a, as a right for farm practices without the need for a permit, what would require a permit, and as part of this section, we've also provided updated definitions of agricultural uses and agricultural related uses, which is uh, taken from uh, provincial policy. Next slide, please. So the I'll maybe point out here as well, um, the chapters, the order of the chapters have been revised uh, compared to the previous document. So originally the first feature that really was mentioned was uh, floodplains. We've now structured it to be more in line with the regulation. So now the first uh, chapter for features really pertains to um, Great Lakes and the Niagara, uh, shore, or Niagara River shoreline. So it essentially builds on the existing policies. There wasn't a lot of change in terms of the requirements or the, the setbacks. But the policies were restructured for clarity and for easier uh, interpretation by staff. Now, we note too that the policies in the future may require further amendments when we update our shoreline management plan. So, if there's any change in the definition of how our feature, or sorry, how the hazard components are defined, or anything in terms of uh, maybe stable slope allowances or that for the shoreline, there may need to be uh, revisiting of the policy at that time. One new policy that we have added for the shorelines is in the case of vacant lots, we have applied a 30 meter buffer. So the buffer is taken from the 100 year flood elevation for uh, the Great Lakes. So that's Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. And the 30 meter buffer may be reduced subject to an environmental impact assessment or sorry, impact st study prepared in accordance with our procedural manual. So what that means is we we did a quick desktop analysis and roughly speaking there is approximately 500 properties give or take that would be to some degree impacted by that particular policy now what i mean by some degree some of those properties would be entirely within the uh, 30 meter buffer some of them might only have a portion of that 30 meter buffer on the uh, the property and again, these are 500 vacant lots based on our uh, GIS information. So in applying this policy, the key to stress here is that it is uh, to be, an EIS is to be prepared in accordance with the procedural manual. And within the EIS guidelines in that manual, there will be waiving criteria or scoping criteria for the EIS. So if somebody has a property where there has already been significant site alteration, maybe it was a property that already had a dwelling on it. The dwelling was removed at some point in time. The property sat vacant for a while. Um, that would be something where the buffer would be conceivably reduced to fit the context of that site. Whereas a site where it's been vacant all along, it's a large site, there's room to develop outside of the 30 meter buffer. That would more likely be a site where it would be more challenging to reduce the buffer. And again, need to stress that um, reducing any EI or any buffer through an EIS would involve the use of the um, the buffer support or decision support tool for the buffers, which uh, we'll speak about in a little bit. Next slide, please. So chapter five, confined river and stream valleys. This is essentially the old valley land policies now using uh, the same language as in the regulation and also what other conservation authorities refer to them as, as conf uh, confined valleys. So again, it builds on the existing policies, simply reorganized and restructured for better readability and ease of interpretation. A couple of highlights, we clarified the regulation limit being 15 meters from the stable top of slope. In the old version of the policy, it made it seem like we only regulated out to seven and a half meters, which is not the case. Um, so it stresses that um, in urban areas where potentially we may want to allow for entertaining intensification, um, 
The step back from the stable top of slope would be determined by a geotechnical report. In rural areas, the setback would be seven and a half meters. And that's on the assumption that in a rural area, you would typically have more room from uh, uh, to move a structure back from the, uh, the stable top of slope. There's now clarification around development on the valley floor. The previous policy document didn't have any policies around that, which led to confusion. Um, if you had uh, a larger valley system where there is room on the valley floor, and even though it's technically within a valley, um, it's outside of any other hazard features. So the policies now clarify how development is to be treated in those situations. We also differentiate between apparent and non-apparent valley systems and provide direction for each. So just to further elaborate on that, apparent valley systems have a height of three meters or more. So that's where these policies would really kick in. And non-apparent valleys have a height less than three meters. So again, measured from the valley floor to the the uh, the tableland, and in those situations, you would uh, the reader would be referred to the policies of any other features that may apply. So floodplains, wetlands, anything else that may be um, in those contexts. Next slide, please. Now, unconfined river and stream valleys, which is basically now the floodplain section, um, it includes uh, the existing policies again. Uh, revised for better interpretation and uh, readability. A couple of highlights, we've removed the draft policies that were in the old document regarding the two zone uh, concept for floodplains. Reason being is there are no two zone uh, floodplains in NPCA's watershed. So there is no sense in having draft policies that were waiting to be implemented if you had to go through the whole exercise of doing a, a two zone floodplain in the first place. There's now additional clarification provided for fill placement in a floodplain, and we've also enhanced the policies around safe access uh, in a floodplain. Another uh, new feature is the addition of the meander belt allowance, and we provide a couple of policies uh, for how development within the meander belt allowance is to be treated. Next slide, please. Chapter seven, which is our hazardous lands policies. Really, this chapter remains relatively the same. There were a few, um, I'll say, minor edits for readability and interpretation. There were also a couple of additional um, policies added to the karst section to provide or stress the sensitivity of drainage in and around karst features, which was absent in the previous document. But this chapter is largely remains uh, the same as before. Next slide. So with respect to wetlands, uh, same as I've been saying, we've reorganized the structure or the chapter, tried to make it easier to read, re easier to interpret. Now we've added clarification around our area of in influence um, and stressing that we regulate out to 120 meters from a wetland, at least currently, and providing more clarity around septic systems and the ability of a sept uh, septic system to be permitted within 15 meters, or sorry, up to 15 meters from a wetland, so between 30 and 15. And that's, uh, we've also provided an appropriate definition of septic system to clarify that whether it's a tile bed, whether it's a, an outhouse, any component of a system for sewage disposal, uh, private sewage disposal is, considered a septic system for the purpose of our policies. We've introduced a size threshold for applying the policies. That was in absent in the old document. So we've taken a, a similar approach to other conservation authorities in applying a 0 0.5 hectare or half a hectare approach to regulating wetland. So if a wetland, an individual wetland is less than half a hectare, it would su not be subject to the MPCA's policies. So that's a new thing, but the reason for that is we were running into issues where we had um, in a couple of urban contact or urban situations, residential lots in the middle of an urban area and a neighbor flags in uh, someone's backyard that they have a wetland. And um, in one case, somebody prepared an environmental impact study uh, and had a, it looked at, said there was a vernal pool in someone's backyard in the middle of an urban area, 
and was suggesting that we had to regulate it. And the wetland was literally the, well, call it a wetland. It was the size of a backyard swimming pool. And in that case, that's not an appropriate use of the conservation authorities policy. So to try and address that, we introduced a, a size threshold for what size of an individual wetland we would look at. Um, we provided more clear policies regarding the buffers, and I'll speak to that uh, in uh, a moment on an, another slide. We've provided more um, policy around the compensation limited to, or for non PSWs, limiting it to settlement areas and stressing the need to follow the protection hierarchy and satisfy technical study requirements. And again, that is to be looked at in conjunction with our EIS guidelines and also the wetland procedure document, which form part of the overall uh, procedural manual. Next slide, please. Just to highlight the buffers for wetlands. So first, and these are basically taken right from the policies themselves. So the first uh, step is no uh, new development. So a new structure, a new building is not permitted within 30 meters of a wetland. It's uh, there's a 30 meter buffer required. Now, in the case of a non PSW that's larger than two hectares, the 30 meter buffer may be reduced to no less than 10 meters or sorry, 15 meters where it's been supported by an EIS prepared in accordance with our procedural manual. Where the buffer is to a non PSW that is less than two hectares, the 30 meter buffer may be reduced to less than 10 meters where supported by an EIS uh, prepared in accordance with our procedural manual. And the last one, now this is really focused on accessory buildings or structures, small structures where the, in the context of the lot, it may already be developed. Somebody's maybe putting up a new shed or there's a pool, maybe in a rural area that exists within a 30 meter buffer. And now they're putting up a, a utility shed to go along with the pool. This policy here, where there is no reasonable alternative, a new accessory building or structure may be permitted within a buffer where supported by an EIS um, in accordance with the MPC procedural manual. That policy is meant to allow us to entertain those small one-off, uh, small-scale situations and provide a reasonable approach to um, making sure that larger scale development is subject to robust and proper buffers and smaller scale individual lot size things um, have a, an appropriate uh, level of scrutiny on them, not a heavy hammer uh, approach to it. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the buffer refinement decision support tool is being developed um, and that will form a, a key component to how we review EISs and how buffers are reduced. And uh, that is being worked on in conjunction with um, our EIS guidelines and uh, also with the, um, well, actually just with our EIS guidelines. Next slide, please. So water courses, again, reorganize the chapter for interpretation and readability purposes. We've added greater clarity for water course alterations. So the old document was silent, for example, on uh, realignments impacting adjacent property. So we've stressed now that if a water course is realigned, it cannot uh, impact an adjacent uh, property. And also we've provided clarity uh, for where a water course is to be enclosed or if someone is proposing to remove a water course, that it has to be done in accordance with our procedures. And what we're really focusing on there is the headwater drainage feature assessment. And through that tool, that would, uh, identify whether or not it would be appropriate to remove the water course. Uh, clear buffer requirements have been provided. So 30 meters for ecologically important water courses, 15 meters for other water courses, and there is the ability to reduce those through an EIS prepared in accordance with our procedures. Next slide, please. So chapter 10 is a new section and it's to be read in conjunction with the environmental section or environmental assessment policies earlier in the document, but this speaks to infrastructure. And so it's, like I said, it's brand new. It's largely taken from TRCA infrastructure policies. It provides a, a very comprehensive policy framework for different types of infrastructure projects. 
Um, in a nutshell, it would allow for infrastructure projects in an MPCA feature where there's been an environmental assessment or a comprehensive environmental study. And there is a robust criteria in there to ensure that the protection hierarchy has been followed so that, um, again, it's the first go to is not remove the feature, you know, put a piece of infrastructure in a feature. That's the last uh, the last option. So that's now been highlighted in there. And there's also detailed policies to help guide staff when reviewing such policies. And again, this is a big uh, key addition to the new document that was absent from our previous uh, policies. Next slide, please. So just to quickly go over the procedural manual, next slide. So the general structure um, includes uh, process, just a highlight of our processes when reviewing planning applications, environmental assessments, municipal drain uh, works, minister zoning orders, as well as the uh, NEC development permits. There's general process for reviewing uh, Section 28 uh, permit applications or NPCA permits. It also includes uh, the current uh, technical guidelines that we've developed to date. And it also represents the adoption of best practice guidelines from other conservation authorities. So we've borrowed from, for example, TRCA and uh, CVC's headwater drainage feature um, assessment guide and incorporated that into our own uh, procedure manual. Next slide, please. So the procedure manual is intended to be a living document. It's uh, not meant to be static. As we develop new procedures or we make changes to current procedures to reflect best management practices or make improvements, it is intended that this document would be updated uh, by staff on an as needed basis. It also includes flow charts, uh, descriptions of our processes and technical guidance for assisting applicants in preparing applications uh, to the CA. And it highlights the importance of coordinating with our municipal partners through pre-consultation meetings to identify our concerns and make sure that our complete application requirements are uh, stipulated. Next slide, please. With respect to technical guidelines, I won't go through all of them, but just to highlight, the board has already seen some of these. So our wetland procedure document, we've added that. We have our interim EIS guidelines. We are working with the region to make a sort of one EIS guideline for Niagara. We've now added landscape plan guidelines, channel modification checklist. We've adopted other best practice guidelines from other CAs, um, for example, erosion sediment control guide for urban construction from TRCA, CVC, and Lake Simcoe. Again, just trying to fill the void that we had with not having a procedural manual period and not having any of these guidelines to help guide our review of files. This is filling a big gap and it can't be stressed enough that um, how needed this procedure manual is. So it's long overdue and we're very, very pleased and excited to have this uh, to help us as staff reviewing our applications. Next slide, please. So ongoing work with respect to the procedural manual. Um, as I mentioned, we are working with the region to develop an NPCA Region Niagara EIS guideline. We're hoping to have that done early in the new year. Uh, an EIS waiving tool as part of uh, our EIS guidelines uh, with the region, and then a buffer refinement decision support tool, which would use a risk-based approach to help guide um, buffer reductions, factoring in adjacent land use and sensitivity of the feature. I'll just also note too that we have Sal Spitali from North South Environmental, I believe available on the, uh, the call here, that if there are any further questions about that tool, um, Sal can elaborate on that. Next slide, please. So next steps moving forward. So as you see today, we're recommending that the new policy and procedural manual be adopted. We're also recommending that staff have basically a one week, uh, call it uh, edit period to make any final edits and then public uh, publicize the, the documents. We recommend that staff would be authorized to update the procedural manual as needed, as I mentioned, so to keep that a living document to evolve uh, quickly as practices change, as guidelines change, and as we go to incorporate new technical guidance. 
Uh, and then that the documents be circulated to our watershed municipal partners and posted on our website and social media sites and that stakeholders who were involved in the policy review process be notified that the policies uh, have been approved by the board. And I believe the next slide is the last slide. At this point, I just want to say thank you to the whole MPCA team and our consulting team who've been involved with this project, to Leilani for her work, to Karen and Sal for their uh, support and work on this project, to uh, Amy Parks and her ecology planning team for their work, um, to Sarah and her team for their assistance with providing comments and, and feedback on earlier uh, policy documents, uh, Eric for his uh, help in reviewing the land securement policies, and my apologies to anybody I've missed, but this was really a team effort and um, a lot of work done in a very short time, and we couldn't have done it without uh, everybody's support. So again, just on my behalf, thank you. Thank you, David. Um, um, Leilani, do you have any uh, uh, final comments on the presentation? Uh, just to echo, David's last comments, this really was a team effort. Uh, it was in a very short amount of time. We've done a tremendous amount of work. Um, we're confident with where uh, we've landed with these two documents. Um, and in moving forward, as I noted, this will be the basis upon which, um, you know, any future amendments that may be required coming out of Bill 23 or other changes will be built upon. Um, so we really want to have this as our standing point or our starting point uh, rather than taking a step back uh, to our current document moving forward. So uh, we look forward to the questions and commentary that you uh, have today on the documents. And myself and David and Karen and Sal here are, are here to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you, Leilani. So um, my recommendation to our board at this point is that we should receive the presentation and then we'll step into the uh, report itself, uh, if that is okay with everyone. So um, with that, um, uh, Member McKenzie, would you move that we... Uh, receive the uh, uh, presentation that we've just had. And um, Member Clark, would you second that, please? Great. Um, anyone opposed to us uh, uh, receiving this uh, report or this uh, presentation? Thank you. So let us move into the discussion item then, which is report FA4422 NPCA policy document. And by the way, um, all of the staff are on the call, so um, you know specific questions going back and in and through will, of course, uh, be good. Um, anyway, this is uh, our policies for planning and development in the watersheds of the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority and the NPCA Planning and Permitting Procedural Manual. Um, and just a couple of things: we the um, if people, when you've gone through and done your thorough review, if you've come across any grammatical or any um, um, spelling errors or anything that you you feel is inappropriate, um, make sure that you pass that back and through to David or and or Leilani so that they can they can go and do that. I, I don't think we need to be focused on any of that this morning, but we do need to look at the big picture. So, um, with that, um, uh, any questions on on this or any uh, commentary? Uh, Mr. McKenzie, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, through you to David, on one of the slides uh, near the end of his presentation, it had Niagara Region slash NPCA EIS guideline uh, referring to developing uh, a common guideline between the Niagara Region and the Conservation Authority. This is good. Is there such an animal for Hamilton and Haldeman? my question through you mr chair not at this time um, that is something we can certainly explore with uh hamilton and haldeman uh, staff to see if that's something we can do the challenge in the case of both of those municipalities is they have multiple conservation authorities so it would involve a few more agencies to coordinate with but again that's something we can certainly bring forward okay, thank you and chair one other uh question um, along the same theme with stormwater reviews 
Um, and David, you, I think your answer may be the same. Is it is the review of storm water management or storm water ponds and structures? Is it consistent across our watershed, or are we focusing on the Niagara region and the NPCA? Through you, Mr. Chair. Um... I would say it's maybe the framework is not consistent only in that, um, for example, in Niagara, we don't have a, a technical review component to stormwater. So it's primarily the region that does that along with the municipality. Um, Hamilton, we do review that through our MOU with them. In the case of Niagara, the region's uh, stormwater management guidelines are what prevail. In Hamilton, we do use our own stormwater management guidelines, but um, the city uses their own internal guidelines. So it's, how to describe it? There's a number of different guidelines that feed in, but we make sure as part of the uh, review process that when comments go into the municipality, that if there's any conflict between say our comments and city staff comments, that uh, we address those conflicts. But it's been rare that we've ever had conflicts with the, the city that I can recall anyway. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Member McKenzie. So just to let you know, I have Member Rapley, Member Brady, Member Halinga, and Member Clark who put up their hands for questions, and we will go in that order. Member Rapley, please go ahead. Oh, and you're on mute, sir. Um, you're still on mute. Okay. Oh, there we are. We're good. We got you now. Good. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, fast evolving stuff and obviously Bill 23 will greatly affect many of the things that are here if, as, as what we understand at this point in time and some of Chandra's uh, notes and so on. Um, the endangered species. Um, this is an important issue when it comes to conservation planning and in in the documents, it seems that much of the work will not involve endangered species, according to what we're reading. That was taken care of by the Ministry of Natural Resources. Uh, federal species like red-headed woodpeckers are nationally endangered and provincially endangered are assigned down to the provinces. However, the Ministry of Natural Resources and forests have had this responsibility before. The NPCA has been reassigned to the MNRF, but um, they do not have responsibility assigned to them for endangered species. There seems to be a real lack of a program from anything that we see. We think of how the red-headed woodpeckers in Waverly Woods were ignored. Uh, basically, um, uh, we need to get clarification on what's happening there. Perhaps more information will come in Bill 23. But um, also the assessment of these wetlands is going to change, as we're told. Uh, and of course, endangered species and significant habitats and everything are all part of that. Who's going to do these assessments? From the point of view of the province, uh, the, um, basically, it's a question of where is this all going. Yeah, yeah, mem yeah member Rapley, it, it's an interesting discussion, and and um, I believe this morning what we need to, for these policy point of view, um, yeah. continue our focus um, outside of what's coming through with uh, Bill Twenty Three, um, because of course there there is going to be, as staff have said, some fairly significant issues coming into play. But you do have a a good point on endangered species. Um, um, uh, maybe I'll go over to Director uh, uh, Yates. Uh, um, uh, any thoughts on that particular topic? Um, in our current practices and as we move forward, um, 
when there are situations where there are endangered species located, the municipalities do have a role in commenting on that under natural heritage policies. And we also do refer applicants over to the ministry um, when there's potential for uh, endangered, endangered species in the area to make sure that they do their due diligence with that agency and, th and that they are um, assessed and addressed accordingly. So we do have standard conditions and comments that refer uh, people to the, the appropriate agencies. Um, of course, if those habitats are in regulated areas as well, uh, then we do have um, a role in commenting on that habitat as it forms part of the ecological function of that regulated feature. Um, but the responsibility uh, for that legislation does reside with the province currently, and we haven't heard anything um, to change that um, that direction. Okay, I, I guess my, my thing would be, let's make sure we get this all clarified as we move along, because uh, it, it's when it comes to conservation efforts, habitat efforts, it, it is very important. Um, at least some of us think so. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, and then the, the, uh, the other things really I have on here really are more in the discussion of the Bill 23, you know, if development fees are dropped, how will we carry out these things? related to housing proposals yeah. and the green programs being dropped. Um, you know, the city of Toronto is being asked to cancel its green building program that they had 20 years ago that yeah. Doug Ford actually voted on. Yeah. Uh, and also yeah. the bird uh, protection program they have for buildings, um, the flat program, uh, as was spelled out at Waverly, uh, this is in Toronto, and of course, it may be part of what they're proposing to cut back. So, so probably it's more in the direction of yeah. where is this going in 23? Yeah. And uh, this may, may be our one of my last, if not the last board meeting, and I just, yeah. uh, I'm really concerned. Can we, uh, can we table that, uh, those, those comments um, uh, when we come into 5B, which will be our discussion in uh, um, what the uh, what we're sending back in through to the to the province um, is that okay, Member Rapley? Right, that that is great. So, okay, thank you. Um, let us move on to Member Brady. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I apologize for being late. I thought the meeting started at ten. Anyway, um, overall, uh, I've read through the documentation that's been put together. I think you've done a fabulous job in pulling together. Um, views which are not always the same, and I don't think will always be the same. So therefore, I think that the the fine line that you've walked is a very fine line. My comment about EIS is you're putting uh, a fair amount of effort, and I, and I know in my past life, I was involved with a fair amount of effort of trying to get the EIS approach from the Conservation Authority consistent with the region of Niagara's EIS approach. But you know what, if that doesn't work, and I'm not sure that it will, because certainly the region is not, um, the policy framework that the Conservation Authority is not completely consistent with the region, nor should it be in my mind. And uh, your EIS approach in Hamilton seems to be working and there's no uh, agreement that, um, that there has to, that an EIS for the Conservation Authority has to be identical for one for Hamilton. So I would encourage staff not to just buckle over uh, with what the region wants in terms of their do, doing with the EISs, but actually stand up for what is appropriate through the science and uh, which you have done as part of the, uh, the uh, work that you've done today. So those are my comments. Thank you. Great, thank you, Member Brady. Um, Member Halinga. Thank you, and I want to echo uh, Member Brady's comment that staff have done an amazing job. That's, this is an amazing accomplishment in such a short time frame. So uh, kudos to everyone involved, uh, including 
probably most of the governance committee uh, because uh, this has also gone through the government governance committee. Uh, just a couple things uh, in uh, uh, David DeLuce's uh, presentation through you, Chair, to uh, staff. The Chapter 8 wetland, you refer to uh, the uh, zone as 120 meters for comment. And um, I, my understanding is that's appropriate for PSWs. Uh, and I was under the understanding that LSWs was 30 meters, but maybe you could clarify what that is. Um, I guess through to you, David. Through you, Mr. Chair, the um, and that's a, a good point. Uh, if the board will take a look at page 123 in the policy document itself, so Appendix 1, there is a new diagram there. Well, new for us, but it's in many other conservation authorities' um, policy documents. And that clarifies what is termed the area of influence. So it's 120 meters for provincially significant wetlands and wetlands greater than two hectares in size. So that can include LSWs as well. If the wetland is less than two hectares in size, the area of influence is 30 meters. Member Halinga. Thank you for that explanation. I uh, missed that. Um, going to the infrastructure section and um, the ability to provide infrastructure within the 30 meter buffer or setback zones. Uh, does it identify what kind of infrastructure protection systems uh, there might be? Uh, I'm quite familiar with things such as uh, uh, trench plugs, uh, drainage interceptors, et cetera. Is that outlined? And I believe we've taken it from the TRCA document. Have they included uh, such things? Because I haven't been able to, uh, I haven't had time to go through what what the intent is of uh, uh, protections when infrastructure falls within the uh, zone of influence. Uh, hey, go ahead, David. For you, Mr. Chair. The policies don't get into that specific level of details. Um, the policies will identify what um, areas of concern need to be addressed. And then that would be the role of any procedures or through the um, eventual environmental impact studies or environmental report that accompanies an infrastructure project. And that's where you would get into specific techniques such as that or any other mitigation measures. Um, Trying to off the top of my head, I and I apologize, I'm not quite as familiar with the exact uh, uh, procedures from the other CAs that, that we've incorporated. I don't know if um, Amy or Leilani on the call, if there's if any of you uh, know of any specific items in our new guidelines that uh, would speak to that. But generally, um, you know, we now have new guidelines around er erosion control, sediment control which uh, give us extra teeth in making sure we put appropriate mitigation measures on projects like this. Um, any other staff uh, want to add in on that or are we good at this moment? No, okay. Um, Member Halinga. Yes, thank you. And uh, it's just my uh, background. I'm quite familiar with the municipal infrastructure and pretty much everything uh, is bedded into uh, granular beddings, which are basically French drains. And so when you start putting French drains ad adjacent to wetlands, uh, there are methods to uh, uh, minimize those impacts and, and the actual flows. So I just wonder if if it had been actually written in or if that is part of the uh, uh, review in the procedure manual to assess that that has been uh, addressed. And um, I have identified a few things, uh, spelling and grammar that I will pass on separately. Okay, great, thank you very much. Um, I have Member Clark and then Member Kaywell. Member Clark, please go ahead. 
Thank you, Chair. I much appreciate it. Um, first, I, I do want to acknowledge and and extend my appreciation to staff for drafting these policies. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, <coughs> excuse me. Mr. Chairman, you and I have helped to draft policies like this, and we know how difficult it is and how comprehensive it is. So any comments that I have today, um, I hope they don't take it as a disparagement because I really do appreciate what they have done. The only item in here, Mr. Chairman, that that jumped out for me that I'm a little bit concerned about is on page 42, chapter eight, uh, wetland buffers. We indicate at the top item one, new development, a 30 meter buffer shall be provided. Then we indicate where the buffer is to a non PSW larger than two hectares, it can be reduced to 15 meters. And then we indicate in item three that if it is a non PSW less than two hectares, the 30 meter buffer may be reduced to no less than 10 meters. So we get from 30 meters down to 10 meters really fast, which is roughly 30 feet, um, which is not a significant is is not a, in in my mind a reasonable buffer to maintain against an environmental um, wetland, which has a, a, a significant role to play uh, in the ecosystem. I also noted that we have also enabled a, a building to be built within a buffer, provided an EIS is is provided to the procedural manual. I guess the concern is, uh, from my standpoint, I've always thought a 30 meter buffer was a reasonable buffer. I can recall many years ago, buffers being 100 meters, then down to 50 meters. Um, at 30 meters, it is a reasonable protection to a wetland. Um, I am uncomfortable with any whittling away on that buffer especially given everything that's happening uh, with the provincial government. So I, I just wanted to put that on the record, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm not comfortable with um, section 8.2.3.1. Uh, I understand why staff have gone there and why the consultants have gone there. Um, but I think we should maintain our environmental preservation to the best of our ability and start pushing back on the provincial government. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, um, uh, either David or Leilani, uh, do you do you have any comments on that? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, maybe I'll start. Just want to stress one of the challenges, um, and I appreciate uh, Member Clark where you're coming from with uh, with your concern. One of the challenges. I think that may be unique to a conservation authority in trying to apply a buffer is we deal with situations where you might have new development on a vacant lot. And in those cases, that's I think relatively straightforward. It becomes more challenging when you have an existing developed lot, uh, the situation where somebody's trying to put up a small structure on a lot where they don't physically have room outside of the 30 meter buffer. And it's just trying to get the right language to make sure that um, those situations don't, I'll say maybe unfairly get sterilized by a policy that's more meant to address larger scale buffer. Um, that's where staff are coming from with those reductions and the uh, the exceptions to the buffer. But um, I'll maybe turn it over if uh, Leilani, uh, if you had anything uh, further to add. I would just add to that that we are looking at, like David noted, um, like risk to the feature itself with the type of development that we're looking at it, at with the exceptions being the smaller type development uh, accessory buildings, the context uh, of the site itself and what is already there. 
that's in large part the role of the EIS to take a look at those situations to say, okay, what is being proposed in terms of the structure or the use? What is the sensitivity of the feature? Um, should buffers be reduced in, in these circumstances? Should there be an exception for um, somebody who has their house already adjacent to a wetland and would like to put up a shed or an accessory dwelling? So that's where we would be looking at the guidance through the EIS and the decision support tool to help make those decisions. So we're starting at the 30 meter. And then the question is through that process, uh, is it appropriate to offer some reduction to the buffer to allow for um, that development to occur in those situations on a case by case basis? Okay, thank you. Uh, Member Clark, any, any comments? Yeah, thank you. And I, I, I'm not wanting to get into a large debate. I, I simply disagree with staff. I appreciate what they're saying. Um, I, I guess uh, fundamental, fundamentally, Mr. Chairman, when I look at the conservation authority model across the province, we are being slowly whittled away like a man sitting on a back porch with a big piece of wood and he's slowly carving off chunks. And our role in the preservation of wetlands is being diminished. Our role in the preservation of buffers around watercourses and wetlands is being diminished. Um, I'm of the mind that we set a 30 meter buffer and if someone had bought a house knowing that there was a 30 meter buffer, too bad. You bought a house with a 30 meter buffer. You wanted to be next to an environmental area, a, a, a natural heritage feature. There are limitations to what you can do next to that natural area. Um, I understand what the province is doing and then I understand what our staff are doing in terms of trying to be more flexible. Uh, the problem is that the more flexible we become, the more the province takes away from conservation areas. We'll be down to a situation along where um, we'll have our building and, and no wetlands. We'll, I, I, I mean, I just find the whole thing rather depressing. And I just felt, Mr. Chairman, and, and as I said in, in the very beginning, I'm not in no way, shape or form am I trying to disparage our staff. I understand exactly what you're trying to do. And I understand the environment, macro environment that you are working in. Um, I'm just a vault, the old school mind that if we say a 30 meter buffer to protect water courses and natural heritage, uh, then it's a 30 meter buffer. There's no wiggle room. It's a 30 meter buffer. Um, but I think I'll be alone on this. So, but I, I do thank you for all the work that you've done, Mr. Chairman. And I'll shut up now. Oh, thank geez. you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Member Clark. And before I go to Mr. Or Member Kaywall and Member Smith after, um, I'd like to go to our CAO as she'd like to say something at this point. Go ahead, Chandra. To you, Chair Foster, Member Clark, thank you for your input. Um, I've been just communicating with Director Yates and 8.2.3.1. If that's the board direction, staff are happy to take it back and reconsider some language in that section. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Member Kaywell. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so Member Clark has actually addressed one of the concerns I had around the buffer policies. And Member Clark, you're not alone. So in the, um, the report on the consultation, uh, I think uh, one of the uh, feedback was at least one member indicated it should be a 30 meter buffer and that should be it. I'm very pleased to say that I was the person who provided that input uh, as, through the consultation process. So I'm completely in agreement with you. However, I do have a couple other questions. Um, one on the consultation process, uh, I believe you said September 19th, there was a public information session for environmental NGOs. 
Was there any uh, outreach notification to make those uh, environmental NGOs aware that a public information session had been scheduled for September 19th? Mm -hmm. And then the second question would be, was there any follow-up done with any of them to understand why nobody participated? Um, uh, so, Director Yates, uh, do you want to take that one? Uh, yes, thank you through the chair. Uh, we did direct email out to stakeholders on our stakeholder list that we identified through the strategic plan as ENGO groups, uh, plus through the governance committee, member Smith identified, I think about four other um, contacts to include. So we did do direct emails to notify them. Uh, in terms of a follow up, no, we did not reach out for a direct follow up following that. The intention of this whole process, if Bill 23 had not come up, was uh, we would have posted this document for 30 days. That was our intention and notify our stakeholders that it was up for additional comment. Um, so that was our overall uh, engagement strategy at the time. Um, but we did um, we did hang online for for a good about 45 minutes or so to wait and see if anybody would join. Uh, I'm seeing Karen saying longer, maybe it was about an hour that we stayed online. Um, and then we did bring that feedback uh, back to the governance committee for um, for some discussion and um, and we've moved forward uh, from there. Hey, thank right. you. Yeah, go ahead, member. Kwell. Well, yeah. Uh, so I have another question with regard to the. Um, Valley land uh, policies. Um, my recollection was. Uh, when we had a discussion about the uh, mountain bike track in the, uh, with regard to the summer games, um, one of the things that had been discussed was that um, the current policy doesn't clearly define what passive recreational uses are. Okay? And I've looked through the new policy document and it doesn't appear to me that there is a definition of uh, passive recreation uses. Have we actually defined what that is uh, and I just missed it? Uh, Director Yates. Uh, through you, Chair, and I'll pass it over to David because I see he's looking it up. Uh, we did include a definition of passive recreation. We did a scan of other conservation authority documents um, to look for a definition and, and we did find one um, to include. So I'm just going to hand it over to David for more of the details. Through you, Mr. Chairman, yes, there is a definition. It's on page 151 of the document. It should be at the top of the page, so I'll just read it out. Means recreational activities that occur in a natural setting which require minimum development or facilities and the importance of the environment or setting for the activities is greater than in developed or active recreation settings. Does that definition prohibit cycling? Through the chair. Oh, go ahead, David. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, through the through you, Mr. Chair. I would suggest no. That in and of itself wouldn't prohibit cycling if it was for a um, like a trail, uh, a mount, especially uh, along the lines of a mountain bike trail. That's typically done in areas where you're off of a uh, paved road. In the context of that definition, we would be able to support a uh, a mountain bike trail. So I, I oh, thought part of what this was all about was permitting uses for passive recreation. Okay, and there had been a lot of conversation that a number of people felt that active mountain biking was not considered passive recreation. Okay, and maybe what I'd ask you to do is just go back and have another look at that definition and see if there's any way to actually make it a little bit more definitive so that we do not allow uh, cycling as one of those act uh, passive recreation uses within valley lands. Okay, um, uh, I guess we'll put that back to um, to staff for uh, for additional conversation. Um, um, anyway, uh, anything else member Kwell? No, that's it. Thank you chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, Member Smith. Um, yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, just a general question. 
um, is a non PSW, a non evaluated wetland, is that does that fall within a non PSW? So when I'm reading in this document, non PSWs, the limits are this, or this can happen at a non PSW. Does that include a wetland that that we know exists, but has not been evaluated and could potentially be a PSW if it were evaluated? Uh, Mr. Deleuze? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, yes, if it was a um, an unevaluated wetland that was known to be present, it would fall uh, to a non-provincially significant wetland, or that's how it would be treated in the policies. So, in fact, these policies could be used to lessen the protection around the PSW because we don't know it's a PSW. It's it hasn't been evaluated. Is is there some mechanism in here to protect us from that? Does the EIS, for instance, protect us from that? Would the EIS, uh, again, I, I think it would be the, the EIS is paid for by the proponent of the development and it's a non-evaluated wetland. Do you see the scenario I'm building here? How do we defend or protect against that happening? Through you, Mr. Chair, the, the current policy document does require, or sorry, the current, the, the draft as well, requires that any unevaluated wetland has to be evaluated to determine the level of significance. Okay. Um, now, in relation to the question about how do we control when reviewing the EIS, uh, a couple of things. One, we now have our guideline document and our um, wetland procedure document with give us which give us a little more uh, teeth in terms of uh, spelling out the criteria that have to be met when conducting an EIS and particularly on the um, the OWES evaluation or Ontario Wetland Evaluation System um, evaluation. So that would be a, an important component of that EIS and it would have to be done by a qualified individual and through um, making sure they follow the proper OES system. And that's something that our staff would be using the EIS guidelines and the OES manual to make sure that uh, the proponent has appropriately prepared the EIS and that it uh, meets the proper technical requirements. Okay, thank you for that. And um, uh, I'd just like to throw in the comment that member Clark's comments on, on buffers and member Kaywall's comments and the talk about reworking language uh, that it wasn't just the two of them. I totally agree with what was said to, uh, with the comments made by um, both of them. Um, I, I just throw that out for general because I don't know how the process works, uh, Chair Foster. If you'll be, um, if there will be staff direction, or if we need to vote on things, or or how it's going to go. M one more quick question, if you don't mind. Um, they're on slide, I think it was 43 on, of the presentation. Uh, it was talking about infrastructure and I have read the definition of infrastructure in the document itself. And so, um, and, and I, I'm fairly familiar with the priorities um, for uh, uh, avoidance and, and all of that language that is, that is out there. So here's my question. We had an example where a developer, or if we have an example, let me make it not specific to anything. If we have an example where a developer wants to build a subdivision and wants to put a road in a certain direction because um, it's a shortcut, it's a direct route to the Walmart, let's say. And so his subdivision people will love it. He will say, well, it's a road, it's infrastructure, therefore, and I have no other viable alternatives, therefore I need to go right through that wetland. What protects us from, or what not protects us, what allows us to push back against that? Through you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Um, so roads that are part of a, sub, a plan of subdivision, those are reviewed as part of that subdivision. They are subject to a different set of policies, for example, under the um, provincial policy statement. So they're treated basically as the development. So they would not be exempt or they would not be given that same um, ability to go through a PSW or, or um, a wetland. So in our policies, they would not be subject to the infrastructure policies. 
Now, if there was, say, an external road connection or the development was triggering some other larger, like maybe a regional arterial road or something like that, that would have to follow through an environmental assessment. And that's what these policies were more focused on. So they would be applying where you typically have, whether it's an individual environmental assessment or a municipal class environmental assessment, but those uh, types of undertakings. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, time check, it's almost quarter after 11, uh, just for everyone, because we do have another report to go through this morning. Um, I'm going to go to Member Woodhouse and then Member Beatty, who are who have not made any comments yet, and then I see a few other hands coming up again. So, um, Member Woodhouse, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll be very brief. My, uh, I want to thank staff for the excellent work. I mean, I know that the, the um, I've been on the governance and, and going through this uh, as much as we have that uh, the board and the staff in particular have done an exceptional job. So I want to congratulate everybody. I, I, uh, the one uh, flaw I think is uh, something I've always held very close to, and that is uh, the 30 meter setback. I, I, I think that, um, you know, the buffering, it is a real critical thing. And I understand what staff has tried to do here and others in terms of trying to um, accommodate variables that may or may occur. And, and, uh, and I just don't think it's, it's, it's in our best interest long term. I mean, I think that if we, uh, we're gonna get into the battle, there's no doubt about it because there's gonna be situations that somebody's gonna think, well, 30 meters uh, may not apply here or should not apply here. But I, but I do think that by making that, drawing that line in the sand, it, it'll have a, an impact that, uh, Will cause further discussion, and and I think that that would be health healthy and helpful. So I too share the member or member Clark's and Kwell and Smith's opinion, and I've always felt that way about the 30 meter, 30 meter uh, uh, buffer. So that would be my only comment, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Member Beatty. Please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. The uh life of this board is coming to an end very shortly. And I'd just like assurances that Mr. Clark's concern of the uh, 30 meter buffer is addressed. Uh, can you guarantee that it's going back to the governance committee, back to staff, or do I have to make a motion to make it go there? Well, uh, perhaps maybe we'll go over to uh, Director Yates and or the CAO because I know there's a lot of information that's coming back in and through that they're going to be dealing with even out of this meeting this morning, plus public input that's going to be coming into play yet, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, so Director Yates, um, um, what's your plans in and around some of these uh, discussions? Through you, Mr. Chair, there is a governance committee being held for next Thursday. Uh, if the direction is to revisit the particular policy on the buffers, staff can definitely do so, and we can bring it forward on the 10th to the governance committee. Uh, after that, uh, I believe our next board meeting is on November 18th. Um, so there, there are a couple of dates where we can go forward with making that amendment, if that's the direction from the board today. Uh, in terms of additional consultation, uh, at this time, uh, we, we aren't opening up extensive uh, public consultation. The intention was uh, we are concerned that the standing committee um, is asking for comments by the 17th. Uh, so we're anticipating once the standing committee receives all comments on Bill 23, there may be sort of swift and immediate uh, decisions that, be, that may be made by the province. So um, the immediacy of knowing where we stand on this policy document uh, is, is um, primary, I guess, for staff uh, in knowing the direction from the board. Uh, so with that, we could come back on the 10th to the governance committee for an amendment or, or a redraft of that particular policy on buffers. Can I, can I make a recommendation, Director Yates, that... Um... Um, you know, there's been a couple of items that have been noted um, this morning. If, if, uh, and I think it's fair to come back with some commentary to the governance committee um, on them. I, I believe there's been about three, uh, three points so far that have gone on with that. So, um, 
anyway, can I just make a recommendation that that does go to the governance committee for um, uh, for some additional discussion? Okay. Um, I have uh, okay, Member Beatty. Anything else, sir? I'm still not very secure in that the 30 meter, as raised by uh, Member Clark, is going to be dealt with. You uh, keep mixing it in with a few others. And I, like uh, Mr. Clark, uh, think the uh, the buffer uh, needs to be uh, reviewed and ultimately needs to be changed, in my view. But, so, uh, so would you would I your have, preference I be have the assurance? Do well, I have the assurance of the CAO that this is going to be dealt with, or do it? I make a motion. Um, well, actually, I was just going to say the same thing. So, perhaps Chandra, um, do you wish to make comment on that? Thank you. Through you, Chair, my recommendation will be to vote to make a motion that staff make the change, the policies be approved, and those changes will then be ratified maybe by the governance committee. I mean, that's because if we are not coming to the board on November 18th, we need the policies to be approved today. And governance committee cannot approve the policies. It will be the board that is approving the policies. So either we approve the policy today, that's option one, with a recommendation to change policy 8.2.3.1. The other changes suggested this morning are um, minor and staff through their editing can address those. Um, if we are, uh, if we are, want, if we want the governance committee to review that policy, then we need to bring back the policy back to the board to uh, approve on November 18th. It sounds, it sounds to me, Chandra, that your preference would be that when we actually deal with the motion, um, that we we do the approval, but we state that the the section eight point dot dot dot. Um, on buffering um, uh, be set aside and and come back through the governance committee um, for an, and then back to the next uh, board meeting, correct? We could do that. Okay. Okay. Is uh, uh, Will that uh, work, uh, Member Beatty and Member Clark? No, I think no, that. No, no, I'm sorry. I still don't get a warm, fuzzy feeling. So I'm going to make a okay. motion right now and test the board uh, to refer the. 30 meter uh, discussion back to staff and to the governance committee as of now. Okay, so that's a referral motion. So um, because of that, there's no discussion. Um, um, Member Clark, I'm assuming you'll second that. Yeah. Um, and so the referral is on that specific section. Um, uh, eight, uh, Member Clark, which specific section again, just so we have it on record? It's 8.2.3.1. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you, Chandra. Um, not any discussion. So all those in favor of referring that back to staff? And is there anyone against referring it back to staff? Okay. Um, that has carried. So, um, so that particular section has been referred back to staff. Thank you, Member Beatty. Anything else, sir? Thank you. Thank you. That's good. Okay. Um, I have uh, now. I have some people coming in for a second time here. So, um, and again, I am mindful of time. So, Member Brady, um, you're up first. Uh, thank you. I'll be very brief. When this uh, notion of buffers comes back, could we be sure? that we know what the science is saying and not just the politics of the situation. So um, if, if, if when it's brought back, I'd like it to be clear from staff whether or not the existing um, 8.2.3 point whatever is based on sound environmental science. Just tell us if it is or if it isn't. Um, and I think that will help us move forward because we've all said many times that we want our policies to be based on environmental science, not the politics of the moment. Secondly, the um, the issue of of having uh, bikes in in Valleylands, I really think that bikes in Valleylands is is appropriate. 
and I want to make sure that the, the staff are aware of it, that it's, that it's not a, 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 a consistency of the board to say that we shouldn't have um, bike trails in valley lands. Uh, certainly in Toronto, it's very, very common and in a number of other jurisdictions that I've worked at and in Niagara, it's very common to have bike uh, as the, those kinds of things in Valley Lines. Those are my two comments. Thank you. Thank you, Member Brady. Um, and uh, and I, I take uh, Director Yates, you can take um, his, the first comment uh, for sure is direction. Um, um, and I'm assuming you would be doing that anyway um, on the scientific end of things. So um, the uh, I have one person with their hand up yet, which is member Rapley. And is that a hangover hand or is that, uh, are you, uh, or do you have another comment? And you're on mute, sir. And you're still on mute. Uh, no, uh, that I'll, the hand needs to come down. It's a hangover hand. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry, Member Fior, please go ahead. Thank you. Through you, Chair. Um, just a, a last question around, um, provided that we approve um, this policy today, how does that impact, say, tomorrow on wetland buffers, given that that seems to be that 8.2.3.1 seems to be in limbo now until November 18th? So how how does that work? Does this entire policy um, come into effect tomorrow with exception to that one? Or do we use the one in the policy right now with the um, understanding that it, it will be updated potentially by November 18th uh, based on staff um, and scientific findings? Uh, let's, I'll let staff make the final comment, but my understanding was your last part that you, you said there that the current policy would stay in place. So, um, Director Yates, go ahead. Uh, thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, it was staff's intention that we would make final edits and have the document in force and effect uh, as of next Friday. So, to give us time to do any final edits that the board may send us and that the policy related to wetlands um, would not be in effect until we go forward and get that approval from the board. Uh, so yes, the current policies on buffers would remain. Uh, we're also identifying transition um, uh, guidance for our staff for applications that are currently in the queue. Um, and, and our decisions are currently being guided by the former policies and allowing for those applications to continue. And when these policies would then come into force and effect for new applications coming through. Member Fiar. Thank you. Uh, through you then, um, from my understanding, this will then delay a new wetland uh, buffer policy by one week from next Friday to the following Friday. Yes, and, and coming back on the 18th, yes, there wouldn't be a new uh, buffer policy in place for that time period. We would be looking at the former uh, policy for any decisions that would be made during that time. And there's no way to have the temporary, the, the policy that's in the, the most up-to-date policy that we're going to be accepting today. We couldn't use 8.2.3.1 as it stands now until the 18th once it once it's adjusted. I can, I can answer that one, no. It, because that's been referred, uh, it is not policy at this point, so. Okay, um, so it's almost been removed from the document for, for the adjustments. Okay, thank you for right. that clarification, yeah. and I hope um, that that we have everything resolved then by the 18th. Thank you, yeah. and thank, yeah, you thank you to the entire team for for all their hard work on that. Echoing my my fellow members. Yes, thank you, Member Fior, and I'm going to echo your comments too. Uh, uh, a tremendous job, and I know this has been all encompassing, and and of course, Bill 23 coming along uh, has certainly thrown a wrench into some of the tail end of of all of this, and. And I do give credit to staff for doing the balancing of this. So with that, um, I would like to have uh, um, uh, Member Fior, if you would move, um, and Member Kewell, if you would second, that report number FA4422 re NPCA policy document, policies for planning 
and development in the watersheds of the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority and then NPCA planning and permitting procedural manual as as amended um, be approved. Um, are you both okay with that? That's great. Um, any comments on the motion? Uh, seeing none, uh, anyone who is opposed to us uh, uh, doing this at this point? Great, thank you very much. Um, well, let's go into the easy one next, um, which will be Bill 23 and, and uh, what's going on with that. I, <laughs> That's that's my that's my uh, bit of sarcasm slash uh, fun this morning as I see Member Clark in the top corner there. Um, so item B. Um, so I'm going to turn this over. Um, I believe Chandra, would you like to speak to this, or Director Yates, would you like to speak to it? Through you, Chair, I can I can start, and Lilani can fill in if uh, if there's a need. Perfect. <clears throat> Basically. <coughs> Sorry. Um, basically, as you know, um, uh, the bill came out, it was last week, um, Friday, we issued a statement online highlighting some of the concerns of the Conservation Authority in very high level and expressing our commitment to the cause, which is, um, you know, to provide more affordable housing throughout the province. Um, conservation authorities have been strong partners with uh, different levels of governments and private sector stakeholders to um, facilitate that. We have done a lot of streamlining to help, uh, you know, progress, make 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 significant progress on um, the timelines and process improvements through the previous um, updates to the Conservation Authority Act and before that. And some of the proposed changes are, are something that, you know, in terms of streamlining, we are already going through and made those uh, made those improvements. Um, since the um, posting of our statement, I've been uh, working with the other CAO of 36 conservation authorities and Conservation Ontario um, on collective concerns about uh, sections of the proposals. Um, as you know from the posting, there are two proposals. The deadline for comments on those uh, is November 30th. And then there's um, further uh, two proposals related to places to grow and provincial policy statement. The deadline for those is December 30th. Now, December 30th deadline also includes proposed changes to conservation authority regulations. So we will be bringing further information to you at a later date. What's urgent right now is in front of you. The changes to the Conservation Authority Act itself and the changes to the um, Ontario Wetland Evaluation Protocol. So in the attached report and letter that is in front of you, staff have written a letter to the standing committee um, which we would like to uh, send as soon as this meeting is over with board approval. And we will also see if we can make a delegation to the committee. They are having sessions on um, November 4th, I think it's today, in Brampton, Mississauga. And there is another one in Toronto uh, later on, but the deadline for making a delegation is November 9th. So the timing timing is of essence here. We do not have much time. The key uh, points of concern are laid out in the attached letter that is in front of you. We are right now um, at this point primarily focusing very strongly on the hazard management mandated roles and changes to the Ontario Wetland Evaluation Protocol. And we're not just opposing things. We are. We have taken a very constructive approach to provide recommendations to the province of how these things can be updated or changed working with conservation authority and using a science-based system. So we provided the rationale, we have offered recommendations. I think our letter is very professional. Uh, I, I think it will help the committee understand the issue. And as they are going line by line to these changes, it may help them um, understand these uh, these changes and maybe make um, changes to the language. This is, at this point, that's the only approach we can take. And at, from, a, from a staff perspective, Conservation Ontario and other conservation authorities have also been writing. I thank um, 
Commissioner Sergi yesterday. I understand it was discussed at the council. Her and I and staff have had a discussion with them. They're dealing with municipal changes and um, um, they've, they've also uh, been working with us on changes uh, that relate to the relationship between municipalities and conservation authorities. Similarly, I've talked to city manager, I've been communicating with her and staff at the staff level in Hamilton. Um, I think the importance of uh, the relationship that conservation authorities have with municipalities, providing that broader regional watershed perspective is critical to provincial planning and urban land use planning in Ontario. That's where we're coming from. Everything else is in the letter. Um, apologies for the late submission, but we are trying to meet multiple deadlines at the same time. Leilani and I will be happy to take any questions. I have other staff um, here online who will be able to provide further technical uh, support if needed. Thank you. Great, Great. thank you very much, Chandra. Um, so, and, and I can tell you from my perspective, um, um, uh, basically, Chandra and I have been in discussion every day since uh, Bill 23 mm -hmm. has come out and and uh, and trying to figure out exactly what's happening and how um, um, our NPCA is is uh, uh, you know developing and, and looking at the issue. Um, and I'd say, Chandra, the uh, um, the big thing is Conservation Ontario and and working with them and and coming up with a with a, a consolidated stance, I believe, uh, would be the best way of saying it. Um, and it's not a it's not a negative stance. It's a look, guys. If you want to build all these houses, um, there's a few things you need to keep in mind, and there's a lot of unintended consequences. Um, I think that's fair to say, is it not, uh, Chandra? Yes, absolutely. And thank you, Chair Foster, for for um, for being available for discussions and and your support. So I really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, and she she was not crying when she was talking to me. So <laughs> um, we have uh, um, so with this with the information that we have in front of us uh, this morning, um, I have Member Clark and then Member uh, Halinga um, wish wish to make some comments. Please go ahead, Member Clark. I can't hear you. Can't hear you, Brad. Please. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was being very eloquent and I don't remember what I said. Um, I do want to thank our staff. Um, I read through the the response to the government. I think it is diplomatic. I think it is reasonable. I think it highlights all of the issues that we have. Um, the only concern that I have it looks like it was addressed to the chair of the standing committee is 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 that correct the one that's going to have the hearings that's correct through you chair and it's also copied to um the to the three ministers that are responsible for these overall proposal changes the minister of municipal affairs and housing mnrf ministry of natural resources forestry and ministry of conservation and parks it's also copied to the premier all of our municipalities and Conservation Ontario. Uh, thank you for that, Chandra. So are we also responding to the ERO? Uh, correct, thanks for asking that question, um, Member Clark to Chair Foster. After this submission, we will further elaborate on some of those things and, and have some very specific examples and make our submission to the ERO before the deadline. Perfect. I, I just wanted to make sure that we weren't missing any opportunity because um, I've found it troubling that from time to time this government um, seems to suffer from selective hearing and we want to make sure that we have every opportunity to share our message to them. Thank you. There had been, uh, by the way, earlier there had been some recommendations that um, um, we send this to the local MPPs um, that make up the uh, the our uh, um, NPCA watershed, and and also there had been a recommendation that we send it to the um, the federal uh, members as well, just uh, as an FYI to them. So 
um, which which seems reasonable to me. So, um, um, Member Halenga, please go ahead. Thank you. And uh, actually, I want to say how oh, I'm impressed that even with the policy and procedures uh, re amendments, they still managed to put together this uh, uh, five-page letter to to the um, standing committee. If it's going to go out today, uh, I guess it's uh, too late to send the email. So on page one, the point number one, wetland complexing uh, quality should be qualify. And just my, my, my anal observation. Thank you. Th thank you, uh, Jack, um, um, that's appreciated. Um, Member Fior. Thank you. Um, through you, Chair, I want to extend my gratitude to um, to yourself, Chair, and, and CAO Sharma and, and your entire team um, for being able to put this response together so quickly. Um, and I support you submitting your comments to the ERO um, as soon as possible. And I'd also um, like to ask if staff can ensure that the ERO proposal um, and links be available for public review and public input. Um, so is it possible that they that be put on our website in an easy to find location, uh, for example, the Get Involved tab, so that members of the community who are interested in um, making comments can do so with ease? Thank you. Thank you, Member Fior. Um, uh, Chandra, can you you guys will take that away as direction? Yep, good. Thank you. Um, I don't see anyone else um, um, wishing to make comment at this point. So, with that, um, uh, I okay. So my mind is going this morning. Grant, um, have we moved and seconded this? I don't think we have yet. You have not. Okay. So thank you. So. Um, Member Smith, can I have you move that we uh, that we uh, do this? And um, can I get um, a member Rapley to second this, please? Thank you. Um, any any final comments? Uh, if not, um, is there anyone opposed to us uh, uh, with this correspondence that we're sending? Seeing none, thank you. Um, uh, Great meeting this morning, guys. I, I, by the way, there was an article in the uh, Hamilton Spectator um, recently, um, um, and it also was published in the uh, in the newspapers in in Niagara. Um, and uh, Chandra, and by the way, I give Chandra full credit. My goodness, you're a media star with this. You're you're talking to everyone across the province um, um, with with this whole scenario, and and it's great because we're getting our view um, um, out there, which is really good. But one of the internal memos from uh, from the NPCA um, um, got released um, um, sooner than what we had expected. So um, part of that article uh, was was from that uh, that early document, but it certainly did not um, reflect anything that the NPCA was not um, actively considering within that. So um, just as an FYI for everyone on that. Um, and with that, I, we've come to the end of this meeting. So um, I want to thank everybody for for the great work and and for going through and uh, and doing this. Oh, Member McKenzie, uh, you wish to make a comment? Oh. No, no, you're good. Okay, everybody's waving their hands. Okay, great. Anyway, have a great day, everyone. Thank you very much.